bada boom. Hello, passionate listeners. My guest today is Martin Green. Martin is the singer, bassist and videographer for Melbourne band Damn the Maps and managing director of a telecommunications company. He has spent over 15 years researching natural health, ancient archaeology, supernatural phenomena and manifesting reality. Martin has treated his spiritual development with a scientific approach. He believes that you can not only create your reality with your thoughts, you can and should actually test and measure the results. Martin Green, welcome to Passion Harvest. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank Thank you for joining us. How are you going? Great, great. Um, Martin and I connected because I am passionately interested about grid lines and energy portals and vortexes, and we have so much to talk about, but I guess I'll just get straight to it. I'm interested in... um, Grid point forty four. Sure. So um, I uh, I I spent a lot of time um, on a on a train uh, years, in fact, well, well over a decade, um, immersed in things like you know coast to coast AM and podcasts and and, and, and books and, and and this and that, and I got heavily into you know the ancient archaeology and the connections between the pyramids and Easter Island and Mexico and all of that, and. Um, Somehow along the lines, I think maybe it was Eric von Daniken or one of those things where there was, I was getting into a lot more information about this. I think it's an isododecahedron type shape within the earth and, and its connections to where it touches the, um, where it touches this, you know, everywhere it seems to touch. If it's, if there's land nearby, there seems to be something kind of big there, like the great pyramids of Giza or Easter Island, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, forgive me if I'm just firing away, but uh, oh, you're amazing! <laughs> great. Uh, so I, I, I figured that, um, well, if there's one in Australia, I wouldn't mind going and having a look and seeing if there's, you know, something ancient there. Um, the the theory, one of the theories that I heard somewhere along the lines, and it's pretty far fetched, but the theory was that if you join these, because they're like zigzagging lines going around the planet. Theory, I know it sounds crazy. But no, it doesn't. Ancient civilizations may or may not have used them to travel, a bit like the way you sail. You know how if you want to get from A to B, you don't go straight to it unless the wind's blowing in the right direction. You kind of zigzag your way there. And so there was kind of this theory that there was always going to be something quite big at these intersections because they were major, well, intersections. So... I know that's what that's wild and it's almost impossible to prove. But anyway, the, what I thought was see if there's one in Australia and see what's there. See if I can find something old or, or, or whatever there. So I, I started researching and I think I found three things on the internet, um, three completely you know separate paragraphs and separate pages. And it talked about these petroglyphs that are out there that are 40 to 60,000 years old. So I'm like, well, this, this is interesting. Oh, and sorry, the grid point 44, there is one in Australia and there's only one and it's in uh, Northern South Australia. So it's at a, there's a place there called Wilpena Pound and Wilpena Pound's a strange place. It's in the middle of nowhere and it's a huge crater. So it's a big geological, you know, upheaval. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the stuff that I read about it explains these dry riverbeds and stuff and these petroglyphs and they said, the Aboriginal people of the area were asked about them and they said that um, they didn't do them, that the people before them did them and that all they know passed down generation to generation to generation is that if there is a, if there is a calamity of, of any kind, they just know that they're supposed to go there and beings from the stars will come and help them. And this is a legend passed down through the area. Wow. Um, apparently. So I got more and more into this. I thought this is pretty cool. So my While girl- you're train traveling. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so my girlfriend and I, we drove over and, um, to Adelaide and then drove up and we found a, a German lady there who's been there for years and she's got permission from the, the, the elders there to, to drive people out there and you, you pay her and, and it's in the middle of nowhere. It is a desert. And we went out there. Um, sure enough, they're there. The, the, 
the other thing I read was that these symbols, it's like a circle within a circle with a line, a vertical line going through it. And they, they, someone said that these just happen to appear in a lot of these super duper old um, uh, sites at these, you know, at or near some of these grid points. So that got me even more interested that potentially th this is a theory, maybe, that something was traveling down these these lines it's it's crazy but hey why not i, I, I had the time we were on holiday this so, show is crazy you can say anything yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I guess i like i said like you said in the bio we, we try to be somewhat scientific about all this so that was the theory and we thought we'd have a look so sure enough we found these circles within a circle with a line took a bunch of photos and there's two sites out that way um and and then when we got back to internet we we searched Google for petroglyphs <laughs> and we, you know, pages and pages and pages and pages and pages scroll by. And we found some of these petroglyphs whereby they were very, very similar circle within a circle to these petroglyphs that we found at grid point 44. And guess where they were? Congo and um, California. Wow. What's important about Congo and California? They're the next two grid points over. You see, Congo's, if you head northwest, I think it is, mm -hmm. the next grid point is in the Congo from Australia. And there's the same symbols there. If you head east, northeast, I think it is, the next grid point over is California, Death Valley. And there's the same symbols there. So how did people there and people here and people in Congo, how are they doing the same kind of petroglyphs with the same kind of symbols and yet they're thousands of kilometers apart? Well, that's when that kind of theory about, well, perhaps these were traveling kind of highways, perhaps, you know, connect that. I was just connecting the dots is basically, and that's as far as I got. So, I thought, well, there's only three things on the internet about grid point 44. I might as well make a fourth point. So just on our band's webpage, in the little blog there, I put the photos, I put my description, but I left out, I guess, some of the airy fairy stuff just to not attract, I guess, kind of some of the more, you know. <laughs> Interesting characters. Yeah, yeah, just the good ones. Yeah, so, and so, yeah, that, that, that's that. I've been back again um, and, um, yeah, some of the descriptions that I've read and, and, uh, and I heard is, is that it is, it's a very interesting place for manifesting. It's a, it's, um, I've, I've met a, a quite a high up sort of spiritual guy from Australia and he spent a lot of time out there and he had a, they did sweat lodges and some, you know, pretty heavy stuff out there and they were able to manifest stuff very, very quickly. Um, you know, things like sitting under trees and just going, there's a spider in my hand, there's a spider in my hand, there's a spider in my hand. And then there was a spider in the hand, just magically just, fall out of the tree into their hand, that crazy sort of stuff like that. And that, wow. that kind of leads me to sort of, I guess, more of that sort of manifesting your thought with, with uh, mani manifesting reality with thought kind of, kind of thing. That, that stuff got me very interested. If, you know, this, it's one thing to sort of go somewhere and, and, and investigate something that's in the past, but it's, for me, it's very, very cool to be able to manipulate the present, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. I guess just backtracking for our listeners, Number one, what is a petroglyph? Oh, sure. Um, it's uh, a, a picture, like a picture carving into rock, basically. So not quite a hieroglyph. That's hieroglyph looks like, you know, a bird man or something like that. This is more like these are ancient symbols and um, they've been dated to, in Australia, these ones in particular, dated to about forty to 60,000 years old. Thank you so much. So a hieroglyph is more like we see in the Egyptian tombs. Absolutely, of... yeah. Okay. Yeah. And okay. So the the travel the traveling or the grid points. When you say, um, for example, Congo is the next grid point. What what do you mean by the grid point for someone who is not um, geographically inclined? What is the well, grid point that you talking well, there, about? There there are these ley lines that go around the world, mm -hmm. um, and uh, L E Y, not L A Y, um, and um, uh, apparently. There's like um, um, an, I guess like um, like an energy energy shape 
in, in inside the planet effectively. Like from memory, I'm sure I'll be corrected. I think it's an isododecahedron maybe, or a, add a few more isos and dodos to that. Something like that. <laughs> Some massive thing. Um, uh, look up um, Richard C. Hoagland. I think he's into a fair bit of that stuff. About I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, I think he believes, I think he, he, he reckons there's a connection between all planets. They all seem to have a so hot spots in the same spot, like Jupiter and Earth. You know, Jupiter has a hot spot exactly the same point as, as we have Hawaii. And I think it's something like, I think he's infatuated with 19.5 degrees or something like that. And okay. as you can tell, I'm, I just, just kind of extract <laughs> info from shows and stuff all over the place and just kind of try and, try and put two and two together. But the yeah, these ley lines, these ley lines have, have been recognized for a long time. Eric von Daniken speaks about them. And, um, and so they go around the world. And of course, where a bunch of them intersect, as they go in different directions, or where these, where the points of this isododecahedron meet the Earth, that's considered a grid point. Um, now, how I found how to get to grid point 44, because I knew that would probably, I know that'll probably be a question, was um, grab Google Earth and then look up the UVG grid. And um, there's a plugin, and you can download it. Install it onto um, Google Earth, and you can turn certain lines on and off, or you can turn them all on, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, you leave them all on, and you know these these intersections show up. So what you're looking for is the intersection points where all these lines intersect. It's a, it's a energetic point or an energetic field or some sort of vortex where these lines meet. Something like that, absolutely, yeah. And you, it's very once you turn it on, you, it's very, very clear. You roll Google Earth around, and you can see they're all over the place. Yeah, amazing. And how did you get into this? I, I understand you were trained traveling, but uh, an interest um, of yours. Coast to coast AM was a, a bit of an eye opener for me. I, um, you know, because it, it's every day. It's like three hours a day, and they just get. You know, it's not. All, I'm not into all of it, but. You know, a guest will come on who's just written a book and they might be, you know, them into whatever they're doing. And you just listen to their interview. And, and some of these people are mind-blowing. The, the fields that they get into, um, I think one of the people that absolutely blew me away, and this we could go off on a whole other show on just this one alone, <laughs> is uh, Dolores Cannon. Yes. I met her. She's, um, I mean, she just only died recently, unfortunately, at like 76 or something like that. You know, what a field to... To be, um, to be able to hypnotise somebody, you know, because they've got like a sleep, like a 22-year-old girl because she's got a sleeping disorder, regress her back to where you think it'll probably be that's caused this problem. Whoops, you've taken her, regressed her back to a previous life. That's fine. And she's, she was doing that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in the 70s. And then all of a sudden, she regresses somebody back to a previous life that's not on this planet. And all she's doing is recording the the sessions, transcribing them, putting some degree of opinion to it, or not really, no, she's not really. I mean, she's just collating it really. And then saying, go for it. You guys figure it out. And that, I really appreciate that. Now, again, I always with that level of skepticism, I guess you could, you can always say, well, either what she's saying is, you know, what she's recording is, it's amazing. Mm. Or she's just like probably the best science, um, science fiction author of all time, <laughs> whatever it is. But I mean, there's, I've been right through her whole collection and there's, you know, she's talking to these, just these women with, you know, problems under hypnosis. And she's talking directly to greys, aliens, you know, women, it turns out they, they thought that they were stuck behind a truck for an hour, but they were abducted by aliens. And once she regresses them, she takes them back to that point. She's able to have one real time, interactions with these effectively these beings and from their side even though she's revisiting session after session week after week from their side time doesn't exist and it's just all one big session again like i said it could all just be absolute crap but it's it's mind-blowing that sort of stuff's crazy so you know that's just one example but yeah i i you know i got into took a loss for a little while up until he i think until he got on the tv and eric von daniken and zachariah sitchin um you know, the Sumerian tablets, you know, and it goes on. Um, just sort of got more and more interesting in Mexico, Egypt, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
a lot of research. I guess I just want to go back to the traveling points. When you mentioned the grid points, they're traveling points. What, what did you mean by traveling points? Well, that was just a theory. I mean, the I'm very interested in it. If you're yeah, willing to the theory I read, it. this isn't my theory. I read this one was that, you know, let's go back to say potentially Atlantean times, if you will, if they, if, if in fact there were advanced civilizations on this planet before the theory was that, um, these grid points were like highways. Some, because they could be construed as energy lines, if one knew how to, should we say, harness that energy, a bit like we harness, just like sailing, you know, you, you zigzag your way towards your destination. Mm -hmm. the, the theory was that potentially these, these grid points were, grid lines were harnessed as energy highways. And so civilizations were able to, in whatever craft, I guess, travel along them that I can only assume to be a, a very high speed. And so it would make sense that if you have to change direction at a certain point, it would make a, it would be a very good idea to build something absolutely massive there. <laughs> so you knew that it was coming up. Um, that was kind of the theory. So it would make sense that for example, the, you know, the pyramids were on or near that spot, but you know, I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting theory. <laughs> Look, I've come to the conclusion recently that anyone, any, anyone that, that thinks anything has to be in some way in their reality, in some way real somewhat because we can't think it without it being real in our own personal reality. I think you're right. And um, uh, look, I, I can tell you a story about, I guess, creating reality with your thought if you want. Sure. Um, I know you talked about manifesting. Yeah, it's, one of my favorite stories. Um, love to, I'd love to hear it. All right. Well, <laughs> so when I was uh, at 2009, 10 years ago, I had been made redundant. Um, so I had no job and I was single and I came across two books. Most people have heard of these books and most, you know, most people, spirituality 101 type stuff. And these were um, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. Yep. Amazing book. Yep. Wonderful book. Teaches you to clear your mind of all the rubbish that's not now. Don't worry. If you have an argument with someone in the past, there's no point going over that argument over and over and over again because it's, not, it's already happened. It's not happening now. Don't think about what the next time you see them again over and over and over again because that hasn't happened yet. What you're doing is just not washing the dishes very well because washing the dishes is what you're doing right now. If you clear your mind, you're going to wash the dishes like a boss, right? Um, so it teaches you to, you know, be the silent observer of yourself. Sit back and observe what your body's doing and observe what your thoughts are doing and try and, I guess, sort of separate that ego from, from the rest. Wonderful book. But Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh, I think, for me, was a life changer. No doubt about it. I'll explain real quick. The, the general gist of, of what I got from that book was this. Where we go wrong as humans is we, we keep using the word want and we keep using the word need. And this whole book relies on a simple, well, semi-complicated actually, hypothetical. He reckons we're all God. He reckons we're all one. So if we're all one, we're all effectively this definition of what we call God. By definition, of, if you follow this hypothetical proposition, by definition, if we are all God, if we are all one, then we have the capacity and capability to create reality. And if one was to create reality somehow, how would you do it? The theory is you would do it with your thoughts. So we keep going with this hypothetical. Obviously, this all falls over if we're not God. And I, I haven't re actually read the book, but it is a universal theme um, through many, many spirit. I don't like to use, always use the word spiritual, but... Um, enlightened books that I have read, it is a universal theme that the, the power of your thoughts creates your reality. Absolutely. And there's enough guys doing it. The Secret and Anthony Robbins and all these guys. Abraham Hicks and... Massive proponents of it, right? So this, it, it makes perfect sense that this, there could be something in it, right? So this is where, as per what you read in my bio, was that I, I like to apply some level of A, scepticism and B, some level of spirit, uh, um, scientific, you know, Measurement, if you will. So we keep going with this hypothetical proposition. So if this is the case, and we can create reality with our thoughts, this is where the, the, I love the detail of the book where he says, this is where you go wrong. You keep saying, I need money. I want a girlfriend. Mm. If, 
if this is all true and you can create reality with your thoughts and you keep saying to yourself, I need money, what are you really creating? You're creating the state of needing, which is to never have. Luck, yeah. You never, ever have money or you, because you're always wanting money. To want is to not have. So if this is all true, we're doing the worst thing we possibly could by constantly saying that we're in a wanting state instead of a having state. So it makes perfect sense to say, well, I have money or I am getting better or I am more and more successful every day or I have, you know, you pick whatever mantra it is if, you know, that, you, that you require. So, and not only that, but, but your actions. It's, it's more than just, you know, a daily mantra. It's, it's about if you, money's a good one because everybody, a lot, a lot of people are focused on it. If you are generous, then you're announcing to the universe that you have money with your actions. So therefore, you have money. You're always generous. I am generous because I have money. So you have money. The way to be happy is not the result of when I get a girlfriend, I'll be happy. The only way to be happy is to be happy. Now, be happy now. Be happy right now. Absolutely. So this was the point when I said, well, I can just test this. This is real easy to test. Let me get up every day, morning run, running towards the sun, and I'm going to start saying one thing. I'm going to start saying just what he said in the book. I am more and more successful every day. There isn't, there isn't anything negative about that. It's not, you know, it's not a wanting or a needing. It's an am. And it's a simple, beautiful growth. And growth is measurable. So there I was, perfect time. Single, no job, no income, just in a band, chugging away, doing our thing. Playing shows, doing our thing. So I started this, I got a job, and um, it was a job that paid just a little bit more than what I was earning before, uh, about 60 grand, a sales type job. Mm -hmm. And I was getting up five days a week saying my daily mantra, I'm more and more successful every day. Within three years, my income tripled. Got a I love that. <laughs> beautiful girlfriend. We're still together now. We've been together for 11 years. I got better at songwriting. I moved into video production. We've released, I think, 25 videos now. We're, I'm better at everything I do. Now, as I, as I went along, obviously, it's kind of scary, but, but you're not really sacrificing much. It's not, like I'm, it's not like a pokey machine where you've got to keep putting it in to try and win something back. You're just getting up and saying something that takes about four seconds to say, mm. and you're just measuring it. You're not doing anything else. So within a year, easily, I couldn't say that I wasn't more and more successful every day. It was, it was reality. Now, this is for the skeptics from the Simpsons. Lisa Simpson's holding a rock and she says to Homer Simpson, she says, well, Homer, by that logic, you would say that this rock propels bears. And Homer says, well, how does that work? And she says, well, I don't see any bears, do you? To which Homer replies, Lisa, I want to buy that rock. The, the point is, she's saying, well, by, by, she would say, by Martin, your logic, you would say that, well, this rock makes you more and more successful every day. Mm. The fact is, like I said, I cannot deny that that's the truth. I actually am more and more successful every day. Now, four years on from that point, my boss got replaced. And um, he got replaced with a, a little guy from Sydney, and he was a dick. And um, <laughs> Not because he's from Sydney. <laughs> not because he's from Sydney. He's a dick. And he ruined everything. He, um, he called on my clients. He, did a bunch of, he just did a bunch of really, really bad things. And it let, put me in a position where I had to resign. And so that's when I started getting really scared and I started to doubt this. Oh. But of course, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. You know, when you start to doubt, people like you knock on my door and, and say, let's do a podcast. And I, you know, tell you my story. And then I go away and I remind myself that, yeah, man, I can't deny this. This is the truth. So I was forced to resign. And what happened? I went to a bunch of people and, you know, 
looked around and see if I could get a job or see if I could work with them in some manner. And it, it, nothing just came together. It just didn't, nothing, nobody was ready for it. Nobody wanted this and that. One of my best friends was um, out, of, out of work exactly at the same time. We got talking. Within three weeks, my biggest client got in touch and asked me to do something. Now we run a telecommunications company. We've got a thousand clients. I couldn't deny, even though I got terrified that losing that job, that might've been it. No, now I own the company. This was pushing you. (laughs) Now I own the company. That's amazing. I'm still more successful than I was back then. I can't deny that I'm more and more successful every day. So what was it? What caused that? Was it getting up and saying I'm more and more successful every day? I don't really care. Point is, that's what I set out and this is what I got. It doesn't really matter how I got there. Or maybe it does. I don't know. But, it, but if that's the case, then I can only really conclude, because everything relies on that hypothetical proposition, I can only conclude that we're all one and we're all God. That is such a beautiful reality. I want to ask, and I'm sure I'm going to get asked, are you still saying the mantra every day? Absolutely. But I've added a few things. Okay, and that that's amazing. But I also think it's a holistic approach. I see your gratitude. Number one, gratitude is incredible. Hmm. So stating it 100%, believing it, but believing that it will manifest. I think Knowing. So. Knowing, knowing, knowing. Whether it's, you know, my true love. So um, I can't wait to meet my soulmate, for example. Hmm. Um, and then the gratitude. I think those three really important are really important factors. And then the allowing. So just allowing it to happen. Yes. You know, not not overthinking it, not worrying about it, but knowing, like having that knowing. I think that's a really they're the fundamental basis of manifestation. Yes, and I think continuing to announce to the universe that state. So, you know. Uh, I've, I've added a few sort of techniques and a few other things um, as I've read and been exposed to other, other material or other, other people as well um, to either enhance it or just like slightly different perspectives to things. So for example, um, again, there's a lot of skeptics out there on this one, this guy, but Ramtha right now, um, he says that, um, it's, it's good to kind of trick the universe in a way. Instead of saying, I am. I haven't heard this one. I'm sorry. This say, is exciting. I have always been. So, for example, mm. I have always been filled with radiant health because it's, it, it, it enhances the reality because it's just something that's always been. Yeah. Um, a couple of notions. We can change our past, present, and future in this now as well. So I guess that sort of relates to that theory. Yes. Ramtha, I'm a, I, I go up and down with Ramtha. I, I can understand why people are skeptical because channeling a 35,000 year old being is pretty crazy. But as Jay-Z Knight puts it himself, the experts look at the material and they, they ask this question, how does this fraud know so much? That's kind of the way I look at it as well. <laughs> it's really interesting and we'll continue our conversation, but I might actually, um, ask you later on for all the information you've talked about and i'll put it in the show notes if people want to look it up or review it as well i think it'd be really interesting for them sure for me it, this is all kind of spirituality 101 and i never really got much further past that but i don't know I, I, it works so well that yeah i just try to maintain this as a as a healthy reality and uh, take each day as it comes you know but you've got such a beautiful thirst for knowledge and you know and, and you talk you're sane and you talk so eloquently and you do your research and you're so grateful. And I, I just think it comes through you shining. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, so any, any um, thoughts to go back to grid 44? Yeah, I like that place. I like Blinman. It's a town of like 20 people and a horse that just wanders free around the town. Wow. Um, yeah, I like it up there. The, it's, a, it's a crazy place. Um, is it desert? I haven't been there. Oh, it's much. desert. Oh, yeah, it's desert. And there's a lot of old stone houses from, you know, 100 years ago or whatever. They're all roofless. We asked one of the locals, why is there no roofs on these buildings? 
in South Australia imposed a roof tax so that when people had to leave their land because it turned to desert or whatever, if they didn't take the roof off the house before they left, <laughs> they had to keep paying taxes no matter where they moved to. That's so, crazy. <laughs> yes, all the houses that are out there have got no roofs on them, which is pretty crazy. I thought that was pretty wild. I, I really like it out there. Um, we, we, did some, we did some interesting things. Um, if you go out there, you know, and you're into this crazy stuff, then Will Pena Pound has like a little caravan park there, so you can stay there. It's a wonderful little place. And there's internet there. There's a... Um, oh, thank um, God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, of course, of course. There's a little, <laughs> everyone needs it. There's, there's a little airstrip there, and we, um, we ended up just laying, put a blanket down at night and just lay there and just looked up because the stars are phenomenal out there. We had a bit of a play with asking lights to change direction. <laughs> that was a bit of a fun experiment because so, you can see so many satellites and you can see so many things whizzing past. Mm. And we, um, we asked the couple to change direction and they did, which wow. we, don't, we don't understand that. Like, just turn, turn. And sure enough, they turned. We don't know what that was, but that happened. That really happened. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy out there. There's reports of... Um, I warned you in the in the email. I think there's reports of beings, if you will, um, blue beings have been reported when people go up, over, and into the crater at night. That's an interesting thing. There, we saw something um, down near Wilpena Pound, not the one way up near Arkarula, but there's a, a dry riverbed there with with petroglyphs there as well. Beautiful thing. You can crawl, you can work your way up through the river there and. Locals sort of said, don't go there at night either. We went there a bit later, a bit too late in the day. And we saw what seemed like a jet black person kind of run over the top of where a waterfall used to be. That was pretty crazy. Again, and could just be, I don't know, who knows what it was, but we saw it. But you really <laughs> saw both it. saw it. It just went whoosh, zoom straight past. Yeah, it was quick. Yeah, I don't know what that was. I don't know. So what are, your, what, are, what are your thoughts on ex extraterrestrials, if that's what you call it? Extraterrestrials. Um, well, I think, I mean, statistically and scientifically, we, you know, we, I don't think we can be alone in the universe. I don't think that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if, there's, if, if what's happened here has happened here and there's, you know, zillions of, zillions of planets out there, it makes perfect sense that there'd be, there'd be something. Um, I don't know. It's a it's a very complex question. Um, I think I think there's been interactions between extraterrestrials and us. I think so. I think there's enough. I think there's enough evidence to to prove it. Not not hardcore physical evidence like here it is, everybody look at it. Mm -hmm. I think obviously it's incredibly well covered up. Um, I don't know if the National security reasons, population control reasons, perhaps. I, I don't know. I've had enough conversations with enough people who've seen enough things. Um, yeah, see, I don't know that much about it, but um, the experiences, I guess, I guess the evidence is the experiences people have had. What was it something, did I read, was it 3 million Canadians have seen a UFO? Was it 3 million? It I was don't know. Oh, gosh, that's... It was, it was, it was That's a huge million. number. <laughs> yeah, statistically, just so many people have seen them. It, because, I mean, the, Canada is like us. They have those huge, you know, un uncharted territory and expanses of sky. Yeah. Uh, is it Paul Hellyer, Peter Hellyer? The ex-Canadian defence minister, he came out and said, you know, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's real. Um, oh, wow, I don't know that. Yeah, yeah, there's heaps of stuff. Um, I got right into the extraterrestrial stuff. I, I really liked... Dolores Cannon's stuff on the extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. She um, she's got a bunch of subjects that she's done, like many, many, many subjects that, um, and this is crazy. That and she, where they've she's hypnotised them, and they've um, they've they've said that you know their previous life wasn't here; it was on another planet, and that they are in fact volunteer souls who've volunteered to be reborn here to help raise the vibration of the planet. That, that fascinates me. Um, apparently there are three waves of volunteers. The first wave was roughly 1948. 
just after all the bunch of nuclear bombs went off. And, you know, I think you know, if this is real, <laughs> then it makes sense that if you set off a massive explosion here, you know, put it this way, if, if an atom over this side of the universe and an atom over the other side of the universe, you can do, you can give one a flick and the other one responds, then setting up a nuclear bomb on this side of the universe is probably going to have an effect somewhere else as well. So it makes sense that if, if there were civilizations elsewhere, there's a potential they could be concerned about that energy transfer of setting off a bunch of nuclear bombs to the site. Um, so the theory is that, yeah, after all the nuclear explosions, etc., they they said we need to do something, and thus they sent the first wave of volunteers who chose to be incarnated here from about 48 to 54, I think it was, roughly. Unfortunately, she reckons a lot of those killed themselves because they couldn't handle the, 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 the vibration of, of the planet. But look, I'll, I won't go into too much detail. Just look up Dolores Cannon and the three waves of the volunteers. <laughs> I'll, is, put, I'll put her a link in the show notes, that's for sure. That stuff is, that stuff is bananas. Yeah, look, I, I'm really feeling you here. Um, but 1948, I just feel, and I haven't even talked about this before, but they would have been here well before 1948. Uh, uh, yep, yep. There's um, plenty of um, uh, plenty of literature out there about the, um, I think, what they're called, the watchers, the, the ones that have been basically, well, basically seeded us and have been, um, uh, I guess, maintaining us, if you will. Maintaining is not the right word. Just keeping an eye on us the whole time. Not interfering, but, but keeping an eye on us for, oh, since, since the dawn of creation. Yeah, I mean, one could say, looking at, is it the, the pyroglyphics you called it? If you look at some of the um, Aboriginal, the indigenous rock carvings, hmm. um, one could say they're not human beings that have been carved in the rock. I see what you're saying. Yeah, they certainly could be interpreted that way. I mean, you know, even with a, a rock on a, a chisel type substance on a rock, I mean, if you've got a person in front of you, you'd think you'd just draw them like a person. It wouldn't take too long to get good at doing it, but if you're specifically drawing them in these <laughs> pretty zany kind of shapes, you know, maybe what they were drawing was something that was zany shaped. Yes, look, these are just theories out there. I just wanted to ask you, there were three waves. It was 1948. I don't know. Do you know what the other waves yeah. were? She said uh, mid-70s. So she's interviewed a bunch of people who were born in the mid, uh, mid to late 70s. Okay. And then... Anyone out there listening? <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah, look up the look up the traits. These 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 are people who you might have met. You might have met people like this that as they've grown up, they've just felt like they don't belong here at all. They just felt like this isn't their home. And there's you know those people that you know they talk about aliens and they just talk about they just want to be abducted because they just want to get the hell out of here. That yeah, those sorts of people. Um, so she reckons mid to not late forties, mid to late seventies, and then there was a. The kids that are, were born, about, I think about 2,000-ish, there's a bunch there. She reckons there's, I think she'd figure out that there's something like over 10,000 volunteer souls on the planet. She says the, the third wave are far more um, prepared beforehand, before they incarnate here. The problem is, of course, with, I guess if you believe in reincarnation, that the theory is that you, you, your soul memory is effectively wiped every time you get born here because it would be too traumatic. If we just yeah. got born as a baby to know that, oh, I was actually a soldier 10 minutes ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? That would be bananas. To, yeah, you'd have to, if reincarnation is real, it makes sense that there'd have to be some sort of memory clearing. Um, and yeah, that reckon there's a bunch of connections between dreams and all sorts of stuff. And, yeah. and to have that slow, I mean, look, some people do slowly remember as their life progresses, but when they're ready yes. for it, I guess. Now, th and that's right. I've re read a bunch of, you know, examples of, um, uh, where was it? Oh, I might have been in conversations with God when he said, he asked him if it was asked, you know, himself, if you, if, if you know what I mean, whether reincarnation was real and the response was, oh man, there's just so many examples of, <laughs> of reincarnation, like kids that, you know, they belong in a village or something and they're like, I was murdered. What? You know, and they're like four or five, yeah, I was murdered. I was from this blah, blah. And they're like, all right. So they put them on a horse and they trek across the continent. And they go to that village, you know, the one and the, and the, the kids like, it was here. And they're like, but you know, his body was never found. They're like, it's all right. Let's go out there. They go out to the, you know, the badlands where all the lions are and stuff. Sure enough, there's a body with a massive, you know, ax wound in the, you know, you know like there's a skeleton with a massive ax wound. He's like, the ax is over there. It's over there. And this kid's got a huge bloody birthmark right where the ax thing was. 
and he goes oh, back, into, back into the you know the, the the village and he just takes you know the elders and stuff up to the dude that killed him and just goes you killed me the guy goes white and confessed like that sort of stuff that's one example but there's heaps of them there's heaps and heaps and heaps again i don't know i don't know how you can't verify it isn't there's, there's i think there's plenty yeah um oh gosh i just i just love your story on manifestation it was so beautifully said cool. um, <laughs> in the essence of time your music you I, I'm not a big fan of bands, but your music's very nice. It has a serious environmental message. Cool. Some of the songs. I love it. Do you want to quickly talk about your music and your band? I'll talk about a video we did. Sure. I'd love it. So I've been in a band called Damn the Maps now for 15, 20 years. And um, uh, we've, uh, we predominantly just release through release albums, singles and videos through the internet. Um, and um, it's because 2019. And we can't be bothered playing shows anymore. So, um, uh, <laughs> we, um, you're too successful now. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, you know, like I said, we run a business and we we just create art every day. It's it's um it's it's great. And um, we did a video a year or so ago for a song called "Haven't We Evolved," and this was the idea. It was it was quite simple. The the average music video, you know, pay you know through um through labels and stuff, costs about roughly ten thousand dollars. Um, you know, by the time you pay camera crews and whatever it is and all that sort of stuff. I, I don't know. I've, I've, I, unfortunately, I have the worst voice in the world when it comes to singing. Great. <laughs> um, that's fine. So, um, so what we did was this. I grew my beard long for about a month and um, we went into the city with um, a little hat and we put 99 $1 coins in the hat. I made up a little cardboard sign and it said, I don't need money. If you do, feel free to take whatever you need. And I sat down on a little cushion on Swanston Street, which is for listeners is the main street of Melbourne at about 11 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. And we secretly filmed it to see what would happen. Mm. How long does it take to get rid of a hundred dollars on the main street of, of a big city <laughs> during, you know, effectively a yeah. Monday morning. How long do you reckon it took? A couple of hours. Yeah, it took two and a half hours to give away ninety nine dollars. So how we how we uh, promoted is not the right. Yeah, how we promoted it effectively mm -hmm. was this is how you make a music video for under a hundred dollars, not oh. ten thousand dollars. You see, it cost us ninety nine dollars, and just whatever happened is whatever we whatever became the video. Yeah, we we didn't know whether or not one person was just going to walk straight up and grab the whole hat and walk away. And the whole video, we would have had to have just slowed it right down because it would have taken about seven seconds for someone just to grab the whole lot because there was nothing stopping you. The sign said, take whatever you want. Now, what, this is what happened. About 10,000 people walked past us. We kept a, a rough track. About 9,970 people didn't even notice me. Most of them were on their phone. Just, they just walked right past. It's one of the best things I've ever done because I got to sit there looking like a beggar, but I wasn't begging at all. I was giving away money. Mm. Just looking at people's faces, looking at people's eyes, just catch my face for a split second and then look away. Yeah. And there was disgust and there was disdain because they, they didn't even read the sign. They didn't even know. They just saw me and just assumed this is a guy with a beard and a hoodie on. He must be homeless. Little Chinese lady comes up and goes, why you do this? She saw it. Why you give away money? And I said, because I can. She goes, oh, so strange. And then she bends down, she picks <laughs> one up, and she says, well, I take one for good luck. And she walks off. This little girl with her father comes and she sits right next to the, and don't forget, this is all gold. This, so this is, a hat, this is glowing in the sunshine, right? It's bright gold for, for effect. You know, <laughs> She sits right next to it. She's tiny. She couldn't be more than two and a half years old. And he's taking photos, talking to me. We're having a great time, right? He says, I love what you're doing. This is great. This is great. I said, feel free to take money, man. And he just says, no, nah, man, we don't need money. We just need each other. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So what we did was we took the two and a half hours and we condensed. We took all the best interactions. And there's some brilliant ones. Homeless guys coming up. Are you for real, man? <laughs> I can just take whatever I need. Can I get just like six bucks for methadone? Take it. Take whatever you need, man. Oh my God. Oh my God. Dude's coming up later going, I heard you're giving away money. Yeah, man. Take whatever you need. And everybody just took what they needed. Nobody took the whole lot. They just yeah. took what they needed. Three, four, five bucks, whatever. I love that. And 
and we condensed all, we took all the best bits and sped it up and condensed it down to four minutes and we put subtitles so you could see the interactions as they went along. Thus, we made a music video for $99 and we released it. We put it on Facebook, little, little heading, homeless man gives away all his money for the craziest reasons. The age picked us up within two days, 35,000 views in three weeks. Wow. Yeah. It went not viral, but sniffles. So for us, that's fun. That's, that's, that's a wonderful little, little social experiment and a neat little way to release a video. Because we don't really care about, you know. Uh, you don't need the money. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 what we all, it's what I always wanted as a, as a teenager playing gig after show after show after show, lugging the amps up and down, this and that and all that. All I really wanted to do was create beautiful art, really. But what was preventing us from doing that was we needed a job. We needed, and so that job became what you do most of the time, you know, and you're slugging it out and you're working for pricks and you're hating life. What we really just wanted was just the time and the money to be able to create beautiful art. And that's what we do now. And that just ties in so well with this show, with the foundation and our values are, you know, following your passion, you will succeed. If you're passionate about something, if you connecting with your soul's purpose, you will, you will do well. Yes. I couldn't stress it enough. You know, whether this is, whether I'm wrong about all of this, I don't really care. The, the, the point is I couldn't stress it enough that if you just get up, run towards the sun in the mornings and do a little bit of exercise and just say something positive. I am this, I'm the greatest, whatever I'm whatever. Pick your wording carefully. Make sure it works. How can you not succeed? You just read my mind because I always ask my guests at the end of the show if, if you'd like to, if someone wants to follow their passion or find their passion, what would they do? And you've already answered it. <laughs> just say it and know it. Yeah. Um, uh, there was an exercise that I, I was told years ago, if you want to enhance this even further, why not? Imagine the result. So for me, for example, um, when, I, when a wonderful thing happens, a successful thing happens, um, I don't know if your viewers, this is video, isn't it? Um, I have a tendency to do, do this. Woo! Yay! Hands go up in the air. Woo! Right? So you close your eyes and you take a big deep breath in and you hold it and you see yourself going woohoo because that that's always a sign of wonderful things happening to me. Great success. You imagine it, you see it and then you let that breath out and you set it free. I've been led to believe that that's a, an enhancer because you're not only saying words, but you're, you're seeing it. You're, you're, you can see that image. The more you know it and see it, the more real it becomes. Yeah, that's a beautiful way of describing it. I think it's also called an anchor point, whether you're channeling or whatever you're doing, you, you have some physical action that is an anchor point to remember that feeling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's but that's a lovely way of describing it. And whether one says, you know, it's it's a sort of way to increase your vibration, increase your frequency, or sort of emotion. It's almost remembering when you had that feeling last time. So, yeah, mm. like an anchor point. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. My pleasure. My pleasure. I I've loved talking to you. It's been an honor, and um, I can't wait to put. Gosh, we've got a lot of information in the show notes today. It's been such a wealth of information talking to you, and you know, I really think you've, you know, in in such simple terms, you've explained like manifestation, and certainly I can't. I have a lot of um, listeners that are really interested in grid points, so it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Most welcome. Cool. Okay. <laughs> bye, Martin. Bye bye. Bye.